always had the honor of welcoming everybody, and it is a really high privilege because um, it, what is happening tonight is in the spirit of my husband. He loved this story. I'm Carol Minkiti, and my husband was a fire. And this is a wonderful day. Thank you. short like in this book they none of them are over page long none of them have titles um, and it spans about 50 years from 1938 to 1985 and Shahadi was also a playwright and he was grouped with some of the uh, playwrights like Ionesco and Adam Mohan Beckett um, doing something that was termed the poetic uh, theater of poetry at the time um, so he's a little bit known as a dramatist and not so much as a poet, but he was a poet. Um, he thought of himself first and foremost as one. So I would also like to dedicate this reading to the memory of Atalana. And I'll start with the moment page. I'll read it in French first. Quand je serai au plus loin de la terre, Branche tordue comme nos corps, rappelle-toi la patience sereine de mes soupirs. J'avais dit, elle est dans les rochers plus fraîches que les oiseaux. Je sais que tu es pauvre. Once I'm far from earth, no branches bent like our bodies. Remember my silent sighs. I had said, atop a boulder. She's lighter than the birds, but I know you are poor as a prayer. This flower on the mountain yellowed like our tears. Her dust wrote eternal things across the house caressed by waves. Your eyes vacate the street when branches grow tired of blending birds with the earth. If moons melt like their fleeting leaves, the bells beckon 
and pearls speak. Dethroned olive trees wait for time beneath their reflections. My patience will kill me. You cry like little boats sailing down mother's faces. This next poem is the one that I read that made me really want to translate Shahadi. It's quite short. My mother was more of a poet than I am. My mother wrote to her sister, the voice is soft as earth. At her cheek a rose, at her cheek a book. When autumn sends a shiver down the mountain, Place the swan's eye on your neck. Wondrous wind in the dead of night, I love you, I've been told. And this poem, I believe, is what inspired the cover photograph. Um, and at this point, I also want to take a moment to thank uh, Ben Estes and Alan Felsenthal, the publishers of the Song Cave, for supporting this work and seeking out um, really good, interesting, and overlooked writing from all over the world. Poor Lamartine, I carried your letters in a box. And nobody pitied me, not even the dirt, who holds every flower's blood. Poet's face at the edge of the water, you untied my entire life like these boats. I pointed to the shadow cast by the giant bird in the golden sun of punished months, in the old earthen sun. A song will drag you from one morning to the next and harmonize with rustling sycamores. The swallow's crucifix escaped you. Memory's ferns, the dirty snow of leaves on the well. Ash in your eyes, since you've sinned like the tall trees. Some gardens have lost their countries. They're alone with the water. Blue doves with no nests fly over. But the moon is a diamond of delight, and the child recalls a bright disaster. Like these aching lakes, when fall covers them and turns them blue, like flowing water, an endless echo. Life won't rest. The birds fly in chains. Each sleep has its place. And you in this field, facing so many farewells. This poem is dedicated to Charles Lucet. They don't know this is their last time seeing exiled orchards and familiar shores. Stars swim with arms of salt as beauty saddens the night. They forget this is their last time hearing wind in the garden and the barking image, water resting on red rocks, night with violins of rain. All this magic for nothing if this wasn't the memory of another world, fleshly birds in the meadow, mountains pointed like barns, oh my childhood. Oh, my madness. A blind violin mourned us, a stone fountain. Winter, the faceless season when grapes are black. I'll cheer up in an apple garden in this country water with immaculate steps, and for you, Friend of lifeless willows, doves flying without air, absence longer than the years. When the bird rends itself with song, leaves might grow silent, doubting their melancholy. In the distance, the tune dies, no longer willing to listen. So we walk our Sunday dogs across the sky and through the orchard and exile our reflections, giving a shadow 
to each of evening's children. Yellow autumn trembling on endless trees confirms a strange sorrow like these chains binding neither body nor soul. O oh, autumn, the wells keep your grace. Tonight we greet your fading leaves near a dark cascade of madness. And in this crystal clear cloud, the star like a spark of hunger. To find the essence of childhood in a room lit softly by thieves, my hands rise as soon as I think. A donkey emerged from a landscape. Sound had no memory. All of these objects of grace, the arctic bird with its ballad, and the useless blue of the sky. The history of dreams, the twilight hours, are keeping order. Absence protects and connects them. Shadow wrapped in rippling silk, Abandoned gardens revoke their patience. They'll return when distance ends, the grass draping them in plums. The rose we tuck into an apron inhales and exhales its soul. Whoever lives in dreams never dies. Like me and the bottom of the lake, I lean over the water there's no noise except the old clang of reflection. Um, this poem is dedicated to Saint Jean Perce, who was a friend and uh, inspiration to Shahade. Give him the root of the laurel and not a day's flowers turning to ash. Poet of snow and the hourglass, when what's white is the honor of death. Some nights, saints visit me. They pass through window panes the way we see plants outside. And I know them by their puppet heads, since they like playing with my heart. They step into the house and move toward a purple stage before reverting to their true selves, by which I mean unseen beauty, only testament to this miracle, a forgotten doll, eyes closed like any dreamer. In a space empty and full like a ring, the gates of night open on death or dreams. Mesopotamia and its windows glow tonight the rose warms herself under the lamp like a nun. Oh look, a boat with a lion figurehead is dropping anchor, and on the beach, the sea's long white wrinkles. Those who stay up late into the night in the absolving dark, warm eyes far from light in the naked air, are travelers from the future. The stars know who stops at their windows, who leaves shimmering ladders at dawn when hunters dig in the silence of open fields. My mother lit lamps to chase the shadows from us. She counted our ages on her fingers as the clock struck. My mother smiled as she spoke of the past. The men who followed her were her angels. Now that the moon is dead, where are you, wondrous thoughts? Love with sugar-coated teeth, childhood crying on my cheeks. I'll read this one in French, too. Elle se levait la nuit pour regarder le Christ. Elle touchait le bronze de sa plaie pour guérir, et son corps tremblait comme du jasmin. J'aime dans l'obscurité la profondeur de votre ombre. Vous 
pleurez si doucement qu'en vous touchant on meurt, et nul n'a les vierges de vos lèvres que votre image. She got up in the middle of the night to look at Christ. She touched his bronze wound to heal herself, and her body trembled like jasmine. I love the depth of your shadow in the dark. You cry so softly that if anyone touched you, they would die. And the virgins of your lips belong to no one except your reflection. If you ever return to your native land, slow steps like a horse at the end of the day, come to this garden, locate the unknowable rose, the chrysanthemum with a lion's mane, giant spiders soaring with butterflies, like in a fever dream of childhood. Smile or cry, but don't be afraid. The shadow stirs, then turns to luminous night. Autumn, like a red and yellow net cast over the trees, the smoke of a gentle breeze, a limping crow portends disaster. Dreaming of the girl wandering in the woods, like in a fairy tale, I shout, Oh, love, grant her long life. But the echo returns and twists, losing my words and answers. Love, love has lost its life in a card game. When the sea's sadness and joy blend apart on the shore at sunset, she says, if melancholy surprised me, I'd stretch myself out on the grains of sand, naked and ready to die. And I'd think death is first of all closed eyes, a white night drenched in flowers and prayer, then four candles on the altar in a golden breath. Neither hope nor luck, but the little dried flower in a book of which only love's ashes remain. How to die when dreaming is still possible. She walked through an orchard of soft fallen syllables. The air had lost its color. Birth of evening, the first chill of nests, dreamed the young girl looking around. Eternal return of night, trees hide in their leaves, and silence approaches from afar. Homage to Fra Angelica. My mother called the angels by their names, Gabriel with violin fingers, with seashell wings, and Mary, Mary alone in the house, looking down on a room containing nothing, maybe and only bread and water for the blessings. In the village church at dusk, prayers leave their niches. An angel changes walls. Incense shelters sleeping wise men with its shadow. Lilies barely visible at their feet. And across the candlelit sky, icons fly. Before bed, my mother's sister spoke so softly that everything became shadow. Faces and voices, even the clock in its cage with no song left. A match flickered, and you could glimpse my kneeling aunts in a drop of gold. The holy women. At the foot of the cross, when shadows ignite the stars, women angelic and dark, pierce your heart with your finger. This poem, not words for nothing. This sorrow, not a song for no one. Autumn has arrived with its cold stars, 
There's still enough wind to escape. The African bird asks the time, but the sea is a journey away, and countries fade into countries. Listen through the branches for the golden sound of a dying tree. On this empty beach, she comes only to leave again, like waves. Today, passing time adds to her beauty, shadow, and memory. What was she whispering as she blended words with her hands? Poor thing that I was, I went into my thoughts to find absence, while on the horizon lifted by mist, tall trees spoke to the seasons in hushed tones. This poem is a memorial for uh, Shahadi's friend Nadia Tueni, who was a Lebanese poet. Um, I'll read it also in, in French. Elle a quitté la main de ses amis pour un jardin tout bleu fermé où l'oiseau s'envole avec son nid. Yeux noirs, cheveux noirs, et maintenant toutes les beautés de l'ombre sur ses épaules. She slipped from her friend's hand into a garden locked in blue, where the bird carries off its nest. Black eyes, black hair, and all the shadow's beauty now on her shoulders. This is the last one. When eyes vanish in sleep, like faces at the bottom of a well, a dream pours its landscapes over the night sleepers. A dark sky flees its stars. In a window at dawn, a woman bows her head, still unknown in the dream. Thank you. Thank you, everyone at Grolier, for having us tonight. Uh, now it's my pleasure to introduce Emily Skillings. Uh, she is the author of the poetry collection Fort Knot, published by the Song Cave. It's over there in 2017. Her poems can be found in Poetry, Harper's, Boston Review, Granta, Hyperallergic, Jubilat, and the Brooklyn Rail. Skillings is the editor of Parallel Movement of the Hands, five unfinished longer works by John Ashbery, which was published by Echo Harper Collins in 2021. That book is also available. She's a member of the Belladonna Collaborative, a feminist poetry collective, small press, and event series. She currently teaches creative writing at Yale, NYU, and Columbia, and lives in Brooklyn. Please welcome, Emily. start with an Ashbury poem from this book, but I haven't figured out which one I'm going to read yet, so I'm going to do this very quickly. Um, okay, there we go. Um, this is from um, a manuscript that I found when I was packing up Ashbury's apartment in 2018, um, tucked in a file cabinet. Um, and what he was doing was there's a, a work, um, Opus 740, by the composer Carl Cherney. Um, who composed these kind of tedious uh, pieces for students who are learning how to play piano. Um, and so they have, they have titles like Light Articulation of the Left Hand, Parallel Movement of the Hands, Still, Skill in Alternating Fingers, they have these wonderful titles. And there were 50 um, of them in, the, in, the, in Cherney's composition, and Ashbury only got to 26. Um, so it, it kind of was paused in the middle and never taken back up, but there are these kind of wonderful um, poems. It's kind of a semi ecrastic project um, written in 2007. And uh, this one is called Light Articulation of the Left Hand, and it starts with an epigraph from Wallace Stevens from his poems, th poem Things of August. And it's, he could understand the things at home. Scribbled on the expansive mist, the desire of many dwindles to us, and our activities, wholesome or otherwise. 
soon it becomes apparent that neither they nor I have any prize on the Fablio's demands of unity. We are aching neither here nor there. The tent caterpillars shrug off the tent and proceed. Was there a maxillary half buried in the silt? If so, what were we doing in earth heaven? Times came to be trembled on the tilt of a sword's point and slid off into the grass. See, there was no warranty. It's not like stuff you send away for, and it comes, and you can't remember why you ordered it. These, our time, were like grain, necessary and, 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 and inedible. In time, the minute pallets got chucked. We were standing on the green, cutting, and our recollections came to resemble history. Serious, but not too serious. Redundant, and so on. So, I'll read. Th um, thanks so much um, to James and Carol um, for having us, and thanks again to Ben Estes and Alison Paul at the Song Cave. Um, I also want to thank Aaron Fagan, who kind of like yeah. <laughs> invited us all here together. Hi, Aaron, if you're there. Um, we wish you were here, and we miss you. Um, so I'm going to read the, the shortest poem from this book, Fort Knopf, which came out in 2017. I've always been mesmerized by dead fish in supermarkets, like when they're all piled up and they're, they're dead, and they, they look so strange, and they're kind of ripped from their environment. Um, and so this poem's about that. Uh, it's called ShopRite. Like dead fish positioned on a shaved ice incline, mouths agape towards some vast white space, I'm curving muscular spines toward the monger of the century. I will not him or anyone. I will not let him or anyone take their eyes off mine, my 18 cold, wet eyes. I've been writing a lot of animal poems during the pandemic. I got into birding, really. And so here's some bird. <laughs> this one is called uh, Rose Crowned Night Girl. I am pointless. This I come to know by pressing ear to night's machinery. Outside, the words rub each other until they are dull. Calibrate, resurface, surface, invest, investigate, snowy, open, environ, woman, wooden, system. I look where little nodes of language cling like and like to what will have them. The air framed beyond the high window is an invitation. I could grab something, sample the pie and salad. I could recite what I play at knowing be disassembled by an institution or human person, could get inside a tree and take up position as one who with her yellow eye stalks forms. I didn't know I was looking for it, but sure, but sure. A chemic silver, a thought darting through another's wet plumage. Must I convene myself again? And it is mournful, the recognition of one's own phrase, a headless fish, there's no fish, width of some finger, writhing, cemented there. An environmental poem. I think to send pictures of the brick-colored ones, spotted and with stalks fatter than their little heads, to the amateur mycologist with the questionable beard. He told me to read a book called The Expanded Mind, and how a bird's nest is considered by certain experts to be an extension of its brain and being. Or was it its DNA? I can't be entirely sure as the great lawn stretches before me, waving me out until it is interrupted by the road, full of the ghostly trails of parcels and people and what carries them, each journey an underline that reinforces like a fattening braid of habitual fibers its being there. How awful there is a road behind before me. How awful there is a house behind me. Its bottles and food, dulling syrups, devices, its chemicals, 
the imprisoned plants and shapes of yielding plushness, paintings of the sea. Must one climb back into its clutches, the cover lit white and cloying as foam? The other option is to go somewhere, but that is where that lizard bitch lives, with her rich stepbrothers, the floods to carry her. I wear a silk garment studded with miniature islands receding into a turquoise ocean. Inside, the climate control leaps into action. A tracking number moans into my palm. Today I have tried to make a palm a trap of twigs and mud where I am in paste and decay. I press against the walls until they are curved by my breast, which pricks against the sharpness of what I've collected, producing little pains, open words, constellations that touch no myths, featureless calligraphies, until my robe is shredded, until the blood weeps down. I had this terrible recurring dream where I've like just given birth to a baby and I like leave it somewhere <laughs> and I don't and I don't know where I put it. And um, and it's like, it's off somewhere, like I'll be at a party and in one dream, which is in this poem, I like left it under the coat pile, like on the bed. Um, and so I guess this, this poem is about that. Um, and, and also about my um, inability to finish an entire poem. It's called Daphne. And it has a real quote in it by the poet Rachel Levitsky. Hi, Rachel. Daphne. This thing happens. You write half a poem and then stop at the first sign of difficulty. So you have all these half poems. The drooping heads of flowers you call lilies as a placeholder, stemless, waiting, open-mouthed. To go back in and look on them is something horrible. Better to forget they are there, like the dream in which you know you've left your little baby all alone. If only you could recall where, and you're trying to stay positive. Was it under the pile of coats or in the closet? It needs the blue and meditative light that runs from your body. It's named the name of a flower. Dahlia? Delilah? Oh, the pitiful thing must be somewhere, shriveling in a box, an atrophied pile of sound. There is a window, opens onto a field, opens onto a dance floor, opens onto a graveyard. Rachel, your most glamorous friend, muses that the present has become for all children an ambient gel in which the catastrophic and the banal exist at indistinguishable frequencies. She passes you a glass, and soon Delia, or whatever, is only a nagging thought. You have worn the black blouse encrusted in sequins, the pattern venereal, pink, gold, blue. They flash as you twist your bones inside their fleshy and mostly biodegradable case. You repeat a movement that is like wilting at an accelerated speed to remind any onlookers how you once wrote poems. In one, there was a blender full of white glue with a fly swimming in it, with a fly drowning in it. You could stick your hand in, press pulverize or pulse, but to what end? You've neglected the paperwork all your life. Beyond the door, the grass is wet, the lawn strewn with what you can't entirely say. I'm going to read a couple sections from this longer poem and then end with a shorty. Um, this uh, poem was commissioned by the New York City Ballet. It's a it's loosely a response to the Stravinsky Violin Concerto choreographed by Balanchine. When I sent it to them, they were kind of like, what is this? <laughs> um, but I loosely structured it on the ballet, um, which has four parts. Uh, and. I, I did something about that amount of dancers on the stage and the stanza length that I don't remember now. Um, but yeah, they were like, this is very long. <laughs> um, and so it's organized like the ballet in four movements. It starts with Takata. Oh, it's called Balustrade, which was Balanchine's original name for the ballet. Takata. If the group is modern, where are they going? Cutting across the field, up that coquettish hill, towards what? 
a city, a stone school built by workers where things go to be disassembled. Lines jut out from what we label. Little troop of joyous exactos, sexual in the checkered light of afternoon, beaming into the words we grasp at but ultimately forget. An activated zone where things go to be disassembled. Lines jut out from the urn, the string of glass beads, the stopwatch, an encyclopedia of ranked pills. I found the night to be hot, uncomfortably so, and so I did what we all do, folded back a corner of the sheet so my feet could be free as Frenchmen, a stupid phrase I've never understood. The flower water had clouded a pond of milk on the corner table into which the moon died incrementally. I was there where last I looked. Now I'm here. I'm not alone. What merges us to the journey, the movie, a liquid costume presents itself and we stand while it encapsulates us slowly but surely, a stupid phrase I've never understood. The, fl the flowing water was cult-like, demanded obedience. I attempted to rejoin the moving plot that had continued on in my absence. The group was on a hike, a tour of the history of montage, braiding themselves through the woods, each phrase a casting off, a gesture as much about seeking as it is about letting go, between the trees on which were projected thousands of scenes made up of smaller scenes. It felt organic, casual, yet impossibly constructed. Did the cr trees secrete these images? I saw no equipment. Stop it, said the soloist. You're overthinking. She placed her hand between my breasts, a gesture as much about seeking as it is about letting go. And I realized that I had been one among the women for some time. This will change soon, the soloist said. A clearing dilated before us, a platter of painted grasses. I had learned of such spaces in books I'd neglected to read. They were essential to selfhood and being with others, something to do with true emptiness and sight, and how both were necessary in order to fully emerge as the opening chord pierces through silence. But was this space made by us, for us, or did it just happen? Look, said a cousin, pointing to the center at a quarry hidden by tall flowers. Reflected in the water was a saying we all knew, something about being with others, emptiness, and sight. I looked up from the italicized language to my surrounds. My friends were a semicircle of statues frozen there in the clearing, kneeling at slightly different levels. Marble, exempt, let go of my wet eyes. Two, Aria. The countless spines of trees flare up against a dark backdrop. The man and woman bow to the sacred altar of the other's bow. The movement is more of an admission they are living in the same time. You are my contemporary, and in attitudes we have been similarly trained towards evasion and chance. I don't care, I say vigorously, nor do I, you say, with an intensity of feeling akin to crowning oneself in the briefest garden, a tantrum of flowers at our feet. And it's easy to explain. You want to take my hand but it has become property of the museum. Though I work against it, a thought moves in. So much is presumed, filled in by gossip among the senses. I feel I will always, I fear I will always be dumb and tired, that I will never be released from the repetitions of men. My mother told me to change my earrings every day. Change your earrings every day, she told me. It seemed to me that this was a sort of project or assignment regarding variation and choice. The ornament pierces where there is already a lack, so the act is more of a historical reference to a past violence than a violence in itself. A commemorative ceremony performed daily to the sound of smashed enclosures opening to greet the air. Where once I was wounded, now there is nothing but entry. The leg penetrates the circle the arms make, one day you asked me to haunt the back of my own knee, to picture the muscles of my legs and groin as plastic drinking straws through which lightness could be drawn up into a crown, to set the voyage of my gaze just beyond my middle finger, instead of toward the wall, its novel of peeling paint. One day you asked me to go on, to continue, to do it again, to push deep into the exactitudes, always just out of reach, when I found I could not, I gathered quietly my things and left without ceremony. I became a different kind of person, part ghost, part
tart sponge, a lump of pure refusal. Who extinguished the, height, the hot white frill that wicked life into life? Often the wrists are grasped so the pair may counterbalance. Often the courtly and ancient life is ground into ground. So this is my last poem. Um, I just wrote it <laughs> a couple of days ago on my phone. Um, and are there any entomology people here? Because I'm going to butcher this. Okay, good. Um, it's, 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 there's this kind of spider called a flower spider or a flower crab spider, Thomas the Day, I think is the, the Latin phrase. Um, and they don't, they don't weave webs. They, they like take up dwelling inside a flower, and then when a butterfly lands on it, they kind of like drag it into the flower. Um, so this is dedicated to, to crab flower spiders. Tenant. Crab-like, it uncloaks from itself, removes its own ghostly paper. A leg of mostly air remains in air. The hollowed onion skin bulbs where eyes once lay look out on the field, the din of it. A new body is painful, exposed it must retreat what was once inside, further inside. A globe perched on translucent needles, the articulated twin chooses tomb or home. It violates a form, bud like a fist, like a thought about to give out. There is a pink so clear and pale, a rose can't call it kin. A dwelling clutches close to itself. It's what? It's brief solitude before welcoming the traveler to crawl its repeating galleries, to wait in holy center. It drags the outside there. Thank you. We have time for one or two questions if anyone wants to ask the poets any questions. The next poets. <laughs> you don't need to ask questions. You don't need to. Do that. Great. Well, otherwise, go on, go on, go on. Great. the uh, <laughs> next reading we have is on December 1st with Mary Kim Arnold, Nadia Colburn, and Casey Judds. It will be in here and online. Um, let's give the poets another round of applause for the wonderful <laughs> Thank you. We have some books for sale. If everyone could move their chairs oh, up against the James, wall. James, actually has a question. Oh, oh, oh okay. Okay. So we have Carol has a question. Oh, Carol. I was going to ask Austin, um, what attracted him to that poet that you translated? He was very sensitive. Yeah, I think that there was something about just how the brevity and how crystalline all the poems were, that they just went for a kind of, not a single image, but a, as one thought or emotion that I always felt was so perfectly uh, sculpted. And it just, he said of the way that he wrote his poems that they fell like ripe fruit on the page and he didn't edit them in any way, he just wrote them. And, um, and I think there's something of that quality that I just latched onto. I thought we should have an English. Thank you, Thank you everybody. Um, if you could move your chairs up against the wall, that would be wonderful. The poets will sign some books over here.
Oh, it's on the other side. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. 